Let's now discuss epithelial tissue. It turns out that epithelial tissue is divided into two types. We have what's called covering or lining epithelium and glandular epithelium. So let's first look at covering or lining epithelium. This is epithelia that covers or lines internal surfaces, internal passageways, ducts, canals. It also lines external surfaces as well as lumen. What about glandular epithelium? Glandular epithelium is epithelia that forms glands. Now, we have two types of glands. We have what are called endocrine glands and exocrine glands. So after we go over the functions of epithelial tissue, we're gonna focus on one of these glands, specifically the exocrine gland. But before we do that, let's look at the functions of epithelial tissue. So one of the functions is protection. Since epithelial tissue is what is exposed to the lumen, exposed to the external surfaces, it will physically provide a barrier. So by having epithelial tissue, it protects us from abrasion, dehydration, destruction by chemical or biological agents. Remember, epithelial tissue is the most exposed tissue because after all, it's what's facing the lumen, is what's facing the exposed surfaces. Well, what else does epithelial tissue do? Well, it controls permeability. Basically, any substance that enter or leaves the body must cross epithelial tissue. Now, some are relatively impermeable, that means nothing can cross, while some are easily crossed. It also allows for absorption, exchange, secretion, and excretion. So what exactly is absorption? Absorptions are substances that are taken into the cell or potentially can cross tissues or organs. What about exchange? Exchange is basically just exchanging of substances. So some substances will cross into tissues and organs, while other substances will go the opposite direction. What about secretion. Secretion are substances that are produced and released or discharged from a cell, organ, or gland. Now what about excretion? Excretion means removal of wastes. So for example, excretion of urine or excretion of fecal matter or feces. So another function is secretion. Epithelial tissue has the ability to produce products that are released or that are discharged. And because of that, we call those epithelial cells that have this capability as glandular or gland cells. Now, some can be scattered among other cell types in the epithelium or can make up most of the epithelia, something that we're going to be looking at when we actually get into the discussion of glands. Now, we call glandular epithelium as essentially epithelia that makes up the glands. So once again, I'll look at this glandular epithelium once we've gone through these four functions. Now, keep in mind that all glands are made up of epithelia. So that secretes or produces or discharges the following products. Well, mucus, hormones, digestive enzymes, sweat, milk, oil, earwax, all of these secretions are produced by glandular epithelium. The last function of epithelial tissue is sensation. So we have what are called neuroepithelium. These are specialized epithelia that functions as receptors for special senses, such as smell, taste, vision, hearing. So now that we've gone through the functions of epithelial tissue, let's now look at this exocrine gland that I've illustrated to the right. So take note of the lumen exposed surface. So this area that's highlighted in yellow represents covering lining epithelium. So this is epithelial tissue that is facing the lumen, that is facing the exposed surface. So this is one type of epithelial tissue. So there are two parts to this exocrine gland. We have the duct, which we refer to as the non-secretory part, and the secretory part is what will be producing the products that will ultimately be discharged or released. So you want to think mucus. You want to think sweat or oil, for example. 
Now, because it's epithelial cells that is responsible for producing those secretions, we are calling them glandular cells. Now, remember, these glandular cells at the end of the day are epithelial cells. All right, so the duct, which is the non-secretory part that's not discharging and releasing anything, while the secretory part is the part that does produce products. So taken together, what we have is glandular epithelium. So one last thing I want to mention before we move on to the next slide is the secretory part of this exocrine gland. Their products ultimately will be discharged onto this exposed surface. So the duct is what will help channel the secretions so it ends up on the exposed surface. So let's find epithelial tissue in this image that is part of this slide. So what I'll do is I'll use a blue highlighter to highlight areas where we find epithelial tissue. So let's begin with the integumentary system. So the integumentary system is the first organ system that we're going to be discussing. In fact, it's the organ system that we're going to be looking at after we're done with this chapter. Our skin is part of the integumentary system. So I hope everyone agrees our skin is the most exposed area of our body, right? So clearly it has to be made up of what type of tissue? Epithelial tissue. Now I'm not going to highlight everything because clearly that's going to take time, but I hope you get the idea. Epithelial tissue. All right, what about our respiratory system? So our respiratory system is also lined with epithelial tissue. So once again, I'm using the blue highlighter to highlight areas where we find epithelial tissue. Remember, it lines passageways, it lines ducts, it lines canals. So our respiratory tract is lined with epithelial tissue. Is it facing the lumen of the respiratory tract? Yes, it is. How about our lungs? Is it lined with epithelial tissue? Sure it is. So this area that I'm all highlighting in blue, that is epithelial tissue. How about our circulatory system, which consists of our blood vessels? So our blood vessels, are they lined with epithelial tissue? Yes, they are. And of course, what we find in the lumen of the blood vessel is blood. So epithelial tissue, once again, is facing the lumen. So I'm hoping you're getting the idea of where we find epithelial tissue. Okay, what about our digestive system? Take a guess of what that's lined with. If you say epithelial tissue, then you are correct. So our entire digestive tract, ladies and gentlemen, is lined with epithelial tissue, including our stomach, as well as our intestines, all the way down until we get to the anal canal, all lined with epithelial tissue. And I think we can see that this is facing the lumen of the digestive tract. Okay, how about urinary system? Same thing. So our kidneys are lined with epithelial tissue as well as our urinary tract, all lined with epithelial tissue. And we can't forget the urinary bladder that is part of the urinary system that is all lined with epithelial tissue. Once again, facing the lumen, the external surfaces. How about the reproductive system? This so happens to be of a female. Is that lined with epithelial tissue? Yes, it is. So I'm hoping that you're seeing the pattern, this consistent pattern, as far as epithelial tissue is concerned. And in fact, it also lines the uterus all the way down through the vagina. So epithelial tissue facing the lumen. Okay, now what about glandular epithelium? Is that represented in this picture? Yes, it is. So this time I'll use a pink highlighter. Okay, so let's go ahead and highlight glandular epithelium that forms the glands. So the areas that I'm highlighting in pink, ladies and gentlemen, represents glandular epithelium. Take note of the arrow, right? So the arrow is showing the discharge of the product. In other words, secretion. And it's being secreted onto the lumen or some external surface. So where else do we find glandular epithelium? Well, over here as well. So the areas that I highlighted in pink, these are good examples of extracrine glands where the products are being discharged onto some type of lumen or external surface. Now, 
Another gland that we haven't yet discussed, but I did mention in the previous slide, are endocrine glands. So that too is represented in this image. So this time I'll use a green highlighter to show the endocrine gland. And it's this one right here that's all highlighted in green. So we will talk about these glands later on. Another thing I want you to take notice is secretion and exchange. So remember, when it comes to secretion, this is where products are being discharged, uh, products such as mucus, hormones, digestive enzymes, that sort of thing. So your endocrine glands also is secreting because the cells are producing products that are ultimately released or discharged. What about exchanged? So you see these arrows going back and forth. That is meant to represent substances that are exchanged. So in the previous slide, we talked about exchange. So a good example of that is what happens at our lungs, gas exchange. So your carbon dioxide is what enters our lungs and your oxygen is what leaves our lungs. So what we have is an exchange of gases carbon dioxide and oxygen at our lungs. So that is a classic example of exchanged. Now, the details of this is gonna be discussed in the respiratory system next semester. So the next two slides, we'll look at the characteristics of epithelial tissue. So let's begin with cellularity. Epithelial tissue is composed almost entirely of cells that are closely bound together. Furthermore, it can potentially form bonds with the extracellular material or with the extracellular matrix. And we see this when we look at the basal surfaces of these epithelial tissue. The next characteristic is polarity. So these epithelial cells have three surfaces, something that we've already discussed previously. We have the apical surface, which is the exposed surface, or it's the part of the plasma membrane that faces the exposed surface or the lumen. So if we turn to my drawing that I made to the right, the yellow highlighted area is the apical surface. And let's go ahead and write that down, apical surface. Now, the second surface is what's called the basal surface. And this is the surface of the epithelial cell that's attached to the basement membrane. So the area that is shaded in blue is the basal surface. So let's look at this basement membrane more carefully. So this basement membrane has two components to it. We have what's called the basal lamina and the reticular lamina. So let's go ahead and number these two components of the basement membrane so then we can relate it to the image that I drew to the right. So the first component is the basal lamina, and I'll number that number one, and the reticular lamina is the second component of the basement membrane. So going back to my picture, this red line is the basal lamina, and the blue line is the reticular lamina. So just so we're on the same page, please remember these are the two components of the basement membrane. So the part of the basement membrane that is in direct contact with the basal surface of this epithelial cell is the basal lamina. So deep to the basal lamina is the reticular lamina. We can also see this in this image down over here. So here is your basal lamina and here is your reticular lamina. Taken together, that's part of the basement membrane. So if you're asked on the exam, the basal surface is in direct contact with what component of the basement membrane? Your answer should be basal lamina because that's the more superficial component of the basement membrane. And then deep to that is the reticular lamina. Now, one thing I want to point out is how do we anchor this epithelial cell to the underlying basement membrane? So we talked about one of these cellular junctions and that's the hemidesmosomes. So if we really wanted to complete my drawing, we would include the hemidesmosomes. Now, what we find directly deep to the basement membrane, and I mean directly deep to this basement membrane, is connective tissue. Now, the specific type of connective tissue is areolar connective tissue. Okay, so I'll go ahead and highlight the area in yellow from my drawing just to indicate that that is the connective tissue 
that is directly deep to the basement membrane, the areolar connective tissue. If we relate it back to this image, there it is. Okay, so this is the connective tissue layer that is directly deep to the basement membrane. In other words, it's directly deep to the reticular lamina, which is one of the components of the basement membrane. The third surface is the lateral surface. So this is where we're going to find most of those cellular junctions, if they're there. So for example, along the lateral surfaces is where we're going to find your desmosomes, if they exist. We're going to find your gap junctions, if they're there. And this is also where we're going to find your adherence junctions. So we have these images that you see here that's showing us the apical surface, and I think it's clear that this is essentially the surface that is the exposed, and I'm highlighting it all in yellow. While the lateral surface is what we find laterally, and once again, this is where we have those cellular junctions if the tissue happens to have them. And of course, we have the basal surface, and this is what's in direct contact, once again, with the basement membrane. Now, let's look at this apical surface in more detail, okay? It turns out that some apical surfaces of some epithelial cells or epithelial tissue can have cilia or microvilli. So, look, referring to my image to the left, here is this cilia. So, cilia is plural and cilium is singular. So, what are they? They are hair-like extensions. All right, so remember, some epithelial tissue will have this hair-like extensions that are referred to as cilia. So if we're looking at one hair-like extension, then it's referred to as cilium. If we're looking at two or more, then it's cilia. So why are they there? Now, they're there if this epithelial tissue has to move things along. So, for example, in our respiratory tract, we have cilia. So if a dust particle lands on the surface of the epithelial tissue, then we're able to propel, we're able to move that dust particle. And that's essentially what cilia will do. It helps move things along. Another structure that we can find in some epithelial tissues are finger-like projections that we refer to as microvilli. So microvilli is the plural form, while microvillus is the singular form. So if we're looking at one finger-like projection, it's microvillus. If we're looking at two or more, then it's microvilli. So why do some epithelial tissue have them on their apical surface or apical surface? It is all about surface area. So what these microvilli will provide is more surface area. So you'll see this, especially when we're looking at tissue that's involved in absorption, when it's trying to take things into the cell. Now take note, there will be some epithelial tissue that do not have either. They don't have cilia, nor do they have microvilli. It just depends upon where this epithelial tissue is located and what its function is.